Welcome back, class. Congratulations on finishing your second midterm. Uh, Daniel's well on its on his way to grading those. Glancing over them, looks like everyone did very well. So today we're going to finish up our discussion uh, of the renormalization group, uh, which is a non-perturbative, non-mean field attempt to describe the Ising model at its critical point works pretty well. Leverage is an idea of scale invariance at the critical point. And we'll move on to focus on for the remainder of the week to numerical approaches for tackling the Ising model and interacting systems in general. And specifically, we'll discuss the application of Monte Carlo algorithms to sample configurations of spins in the IZ model, for example, and how we can bring them to bear on questions of phase coexistence. So today I'll outline the basic algorithm, how it works, what's its kind of underlying theory. And then on Thursday, I'll uh, code up an example of the Eisen model that you, you will be able to, to take uh, and apply to your last problem set. Okay. That being said, let's go ahead and remind ourselves of the basic idea behind our normalization group, kind of what we've discussed over the last couple lectures. So the basic idea behind the renormalization group is to recognize that there is a equivalence between changing the scale of the system and changing the effective coupling that that system then looks like it's under. So specifically, if I was to take, say, an Ising lattice at one temperature, say less than its critical point, where if it's less than its critical point and it exists in two dimensions, I expect the system to be predominantly in a spin up or spin down state. That doesn't mean, however, that all spins are up or down. In fact, we should expect that there will be regions over which the opposite spin fluctuates into existence. And we can characterize the scale of those fluctuations with a correlation like Cassie. Now, if we take that system and we viewed it on a larger scale, zoom out, if you will, well, most of the system looks the same. We have predominantly spin up, but that little fluctuation now looks like it's smaller. In fact, one could say, and we have shown rather precisely, that an Ising model viewed on a larger scale looks like an Ising model at a colder temperature, in this case, some T prime less than the original T. That is true away from points of self-similarity. There are a couple points, the critical point, zero temperature and infinite temperature, where if we undergo this action, this zooming out, the system looks the same. Zero temperature and infinite temperature being you know, trivial positions where the system looks the same because there are no fluctuations at zero temperature or fluctuations abound at infinite temperature. The non-trivial version of this then is at some finite temperature, Tc, where because of the diverging correlation length, the system looks identical on different scales. So that's the kind of jumping off point for the renormalization group. And we showed that this can this kind of zooming out and this mapping between different temperatures can be implemented mathematically. Specifically, if we were to 
take our Ising model with n spins at some coupling constant k, which just measures the strength of the exchange interaction relative to thermal temperature. And we've done this for zero applied fields so along the symmetry line. We know that that partition function is a sum over spins. And we can break up that sum over spins as sum over odd spins times the sum over even spins. weighted by that Ising model, Hamiltonian. In this case, some strength of coupling K, sum over nearest neighbor interactions, SI, SJ. And the basic mathematics then is to try to evaluate that internal sum. So get rid of half of the spins that essentially then zooms out. It, look, it creates a sublattice on a large, slightly larger scale. In two dimensions, on a square lattice, it increases the effective scale. The sublattice increases by a factor of the square root of two. And what we have shown, in fact, is that to an approximation, that one can, in fact, write the partition function as some proportionality constant we've called f of k raised to the n by two, the number of spins we've integrated out, times a, part, a remaining sum that can be put in the form of the original partition function, now with half of the spins and at some effective coupling strength, k prime. The approximation we made to do that so-called bond moving approximation in two dimensions where we had to introduce it essentially accounts for the fact that in two dimensions, I can't exactly rewrite the partition function having summed over half of the spins in the exact same form as the original partition function but I can add in the essence of those extra interactions to strengthen or to move those bonds into the existing bonds, approximating the form of the partition function back into the original form. And when you do that, we get an equation for that f of k, so that proportionality constant, and in addition, we learn how the effect of coupling changes. So the new effect of coupling on a larger scale is equal to 3 eighths log hyperbolic cosine four times the original, original coupling. Again, that's as the length of the system is increased. Indeed, this approximate way of remapping the Eisen model does affect what we would hope for. If we look at how K prime changes as we iterate this map as we integrate out another half of the spins and another half of the spins and another half of the spins, we actually locate the position of a critical point by knowing where, noting where this map is left invariant. So-called fixed points in this RG flow. So K, if J is fixed, essentially just tells me how the effective temperature is changing. If I put in 
a temperature which is small or k which is big, it maps to an even smaller temperature or larger k. So the flow upon entering this map goes towards zero temperature if I start at low temperature. If I start at very high temperature, the flow works towards high temperature and they diverge away from the critical point where if I put exactly Tc into this equation, I get back Tc. So it's, there's a point of scale invariance as I zoom out on either side of this map. That is non-trivial in addition to the two trivial points of scale invariance at zero temperature and infinite temperature. So before we kind of wrap everything up with regard to renormalization group, let's go back through a couple of the calculations that we're able to do with this flow procedure. So specifically, we're able to find the location of TC. So if we have this map that K prime gets mapped to 3 eighths log hyperbolic cosine of 4K, again, K is beta J, we find that there is a critical point predicted by this flow, which is equal to, all right, critical coupling strength, which is equal to 0 0.51 or so. One can numerically solve this equation for its fixed point, which implies a Tc, which is pretty close to 2j over kb. The exact Tc from the Ansager solution in two dimensions is equal to 2.26, which is really pretty close. Especially when you remember that the mean field prediction for TC on a square lattice would have been four. Okay, so that's one result. We first predict that there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking and we predict that its location is not so far off of what is actually known to be the exact answer. It's also worth noting that when we applied this to the one dimensional Ising model, we found in agreement with the exact result that there was no non-trivial fixed point, that the one dimensional Ising model did not break symmetry. But we also are able to, apart from getting the location of the critical point, to estimate critical exponents. Specifically, we have discussed estimating the critical exponent associated with the correlation length it, like all critical exponents, goes like t minus tc to some power, and that power is nu. If it goes like the difference in those critical points, that means it also goes like the difference in the coupling strengths. And in two dimensions, it is known again from the Anzeiger solution that that critical exponent is equal to exactly one. 
Okay, so how do we get that exponent out of our renormalization group calculation? Well, upon rescaling, upon zooming out, that correlation length is suppressed by a factor of square root of two. We look at the system on a smaller scale, the interactions, the exact interactions have not changed, but it looks like the interactions have become renormalized. And as a consequence, the correlation length is exactly suppressed. Length scales, exact length scales are suppressed. We also know from our recursion relationship, our mapping between the effective interaction strengths, how K is going to change. If we look at K, the coupling strength close to the critical coupling, say to first order in some Delta K, because we have a mapping for K and K prime, we know how K prime changes to first order at the, around the critical point, K prime is equal to K. The first order correction now looks at a Delta K and requires how K changes with K prime at KC. And that would be good up to order Delta K squared. From our relationship for how K prime changes with K near the critical point, which is 3 eighths log Sorry. If we take the derivative, that gives us 3 eighths times 4 times hyperbolic tangent of 4. And I want to evaluate that at KC, which if I plug that into my calculator, gives me something like 1.45. So if I rescale by one iteration, I can compute how that affects the scaling of the critical point of the correlation correlations near the critical point by saying that well, K prime relative to KC over K relative to KC. That's how that correlation length is manifested in either the zoomed out lattice or the original lattice. I know that the way that the correlation length changes in these zoomed out lattices to be suppressed by one over the square root of two. So I can solve this equation for new. And one finds that this will be log square root of two. Each of these k less than kc is delta k, so the delta k's cancel and I'm left with just dk dk prime evaluated at the critical value of kc, which is less than log of 1.45. Again, if I put that in my calculator, I get an exact numerical answer, which is pretty close to 0 0.494, which given the exact solution is one is really not too bad. Again, this should be reference to mean field theory, which predicted a half. So those are examples of finding the critical temperature, the A critical exponent. One could evaluate another critical exponent if we have this 
relationship between the partition functions, say one for n spins and one for n by two spins, we can define a free energy density or free energy per spin as A. which is the log of the partition function divided by n. So that's a free energy per spin in units of the thermal energy. Introducing, so let's clarify the notation, that's A of K is equal to log of Q of K for N spins divided by N. Introducing that definition in the top line gives me a recursion relationship for that free energy density, which is equal to A of K, one half log F of K plus one half A of K prime. <laughs> Given I know the form of K and K prime, I could iterate this map and solve for the free energy density. However, we could also just use this relationship to solve for thermodynamic quantities that we might be interested in. For example, we could use this relationship to compute the heat capacity. CV is, as you know, related to two derivatives of the log of the partition function. So I can compute CV by taking two derivatives of this free energy density. We know that near TC, the heat capacity scales like T minus TC to the minus alpha, critical exponent alpha. A of K, if we plug in our definitions for F of K, and k prime, we would get one half a of k prime plus one half log two e to the k prime by three hyperbolic cosine inverted of e to the eight k prime by three square root of. So then that's a couple derivatives we can take using the chain rule to relate changes in a through k to changes of a through k prime. We would, following the same sort of logic we just used for the new critical exponent, get a relationship that is two, that alpha is equal to two less log of two divided by the log of d k prime dk evaluated at kc, which is equal to 0 0.131, quite close to that experimentally about it, which is experimentally known. All right, so those are some of the kind of successful calculations one can do 
given the renormalization group that we've presented, you know, there is a kind of unjust, not necessarily unjustified, but a, an approximation we had to make in order to rewrite that partition function in the form of the original Ising model partition function, which was this bond moving, strengthening the remaining or the pre-existing bonds with the nearest neighbor interactions that are generated upon decimating some of the spins. There are very successful approaches that mitigate that approximation. And in doing so make quantitatively more accurate predictions about critical exponents and locations of the critical point. And they work by looking at the Fourier components of the spin field. So one writes, imagining the spin the positions to be continuous, one writes down a Fourier transform of the spins on the lattice as an integral over all the lattice positions, the spins at those positions weighted by this complex exponential, and integrating out, rather than a, in a real space picture looking at sublattices, integrating out wave vectors that are less than some max and some less than some cutoff. Again, when you integrate out some of the more microscopic features of the lattice, one gets couplings, interactions that proliferate. Just as we saw in what required us to um, do this bond moving construction. However, one can show that only a few of those interactions matter as we get closer to the critical point, and we're not so far away from four dimensions. Again, four dimensions in the Ising model was special because mean field theory was accurate. We didn't have to worry about lots of interactions and correlations growing. So one can do a perturbation theory in the space of dimensionality, perturbing around four dimensional spaces, the so-called epsilon expansion and setting that epsilon to one, in fact, get the quantitatively exact or quantitatively accurate estimates of the critical exponents even in three dimensions. So that sort of procedure is a little beyond what we'll talk about or what we can do in this class. It takes some development to get the, get us to a point where we can write down the spin field as a the spins as a field and introduce those Fourier transforms and how you recursively write out a perturbation theory for dimensionality. But such um, calculations are the topics of uh, is the topic of the advanced physics StatMet class. They spend essentially the whole semester working on renormalization group theories. Okay, so that's all I have to say about RG. I think I've introduced you to the kind of basic philosophy and how one goes about actually doing calculations with it.
So we're really left then with the final approach that I want to introduce for tackling the Eisen model or systems like it that have interactions, which is to try to avoid analytic approximations completely and trade that complexity for developing computational approaches that then have to be solved on a computer. So we'll not introduce any approximations in how we will try to analyze the system and then when, and so once confronted with that complete complexity, have to run to numerical techniques to actually evaluate things with. Okay, so imagine you have a computer, you're, you're presumably watching this lecture on one. How would you get a computer to tell you what the critical temperature of the Ising model was, or what the characteristic magnet, the average magnetization of the Ising model is as a function of temperature. Well, the naive approach would be imagining that we can try to directly compute the partition function. The partition function is just the sum weighted by an exponential factor. If you can compute the exponential, if you can evaluate the energy, presumably you might imagine that that's a sensible thing to do. Unfortunately, this is generally a terrible idea. And the reason why it's a terrible idea is to note just how many terms are in that sum. Consider a 10 by 10 Ising model. The number of configurations, well, there's a hundred different spins. Each spin can be in two states. That means that there are two to the 100 unique configurations in that sum. Two to the 100 is essentially 10 to the 30. There are more than an Avogadro's number of states in that sum that would take forever. In fact, if you, even if you were able to evaluate a energy of a Ising model every nanosecond, imagine you had such a fast processor, this would still take you the age of the universe to actually compute that sum. So does that mean that we're stuck? Well, no, you've seen simulations of the Eisen model. And the simplicity comes from the fact that at most interesting temperatures, under most typical conditions, most configurations are completely irrelevant. To estimate an expectation value, we only need to be able to see those configurations that have non-negligible probability. If, this, if the likelihood that one of those configurations is infinitely small, it's not going to contribute to any, to any average we would want to measure. So therefore one could envision that maybe only a polynomially large number of configurations for increasing system size need to be constructed 
or sampled in order to compute the kinds of quantities that we'll be interested in. So then the question becomes, how do we find the important configurations? How do we know which configurations are going to be the ones that will contribute most to an expectation value? That search is what is known, or one way to handle that search is known as Monte Carlo sampling. And that's the approach that we'll discuss here. So Monte Carlo sampling takes the perspective of the proverbial drunken sailor. It imagines that if I start some random walker at some initial configuration, I can move randomly through configurations with a bias towards the ones that are important. So imagine I start at configuration one, there is some rate at which I would go between one and configuration two. From two, I might have some rate at which I would make a hop to configuration three, so on and so forth. So the idea is to sample configurations, given we know what the likelihood of seeing a given configuration is if the system is at equilibrium. If we choose the dynamics of this walk carefully, which is essentially the rates to go between space states, this random walk will visit each state with its Boltzmann weighted frequency. And we know that it is the states with high Boltzmann weight, which are gonna to contribute to an expectation value. So this seems like an optimal thing to try to engineer. So then the question becomes, how do we engineer a random search, a random walk through configurations that will give us that distribution associated with the Boltzmann distribution on those states. All right, well, let PJ at time T be the probability that a walker resides in state J at time T. 
in the long time limit, as that walker samples lots of states, I can imagine that that distribution becomes time invariant, reaches a steady state that I'll denote as P bar of J. To know how that probability decays to its stationary state, I can write down an equation of motion for it. P of J changes with time through those rates that take the system, the walker in this case, to different states. In fact, P of J can change because a walker comes in from state I with some rate Kij, or it can change because the walker at J leaves to some state I. And if I sum over all of the states that the walker could leave to or come from, that gives me the equation of motion for that probability. At steady state, I want that change in the probability with time to be zero. So one way then to achieve a Boltzmann distribution where P of J bar is proportional to E to the minus beta E of nu J is for every term in that sum to be equal to zero when evaluated at P bar. Namely, if I put in P bar for state i and I multiply k i j to it, that when I subtract off P bar of j and multiply k j i to it, I get zero for all i and j. That's a way to enforce that the stationary state is Boltzmann distributed. If this is true for all i and j, this is known as the statement of detailed balance. It is a sufficient but not necessary condition to evolve a Boltzmann distribution. There are more complicated schemes that can affect the same stationary distribution, but this is the simplest. Indeed, if I take that statement of detail balance, I move PJ, KJI over to the right, I would find that detail balance is satisfied when the ratio KIJ to KJI is equal to e to the minus beta e j less e i, or that the ratio of transition rates is given by a ratio of Boltzmann factors. Okay, so that gives us a constraint for the rates that we can then try to parameterize to affect the stationary state to sample configurations with the right Boltzmann weights. So then how do we actually design the rate constants to have this symmetry? Well, in a single Monte Carlo step, a single transition of a random walker between states. 
there's a number of processes that happen. We can decompose it into two. We can say that at each step, we attempt a random move. to say take state new to some new prime. This, in the case of our IZ model, might be, for example, picking a random spin and flipping it. And let's call the probability to attempt such a move P attempt. After we try to make that move, we can then choose to accept that move. With probability P accept. So that the rate Kij is given by some constant arbitrary frequency independent of i or j, the probability to attempt a move to go between states i and j times the probability to accept that move. A rate is nothing but the probability for an event to happen per time. So here we finally, we design our rates to go between configurations as some arbitrary time unit, some k naught independent of i and j, and then a product of two probabilities, the probability to attempt the transition and the probability to accept that transition. Now, usually, attempt, attempts to change spins or to change states are made symmetrically. Namely, the probability to attempt to move new to new prime is equal to the probability to attempt the move new prime to new. In the context of the Eisen model, that would mean to choose any span, any spin at random with some uniform probability, one over the number of spins, and to attempt to flip them equally all spins up are equally likely to go down and vice versa. <laughs> and this is not what has to happen, one could try to flip spins non-randomly, but one would then have a different corresponding acceptance probability as we'll see here. If we, because if we do choose to attempt moves symmetrically, then Kij over Kji is equal to just the ratio of the acceptance probabilities of j going to i relative to i going to j. And we desire that ratio to be e to the minus beta ej less ei. <laughs> 
again, that if the attempt frequency is not made symmetrically, then that ratio of rates has to account for that bias that's put in. However, if they're made symmetrically, then a canonical choice for affecting this ratio of acceptance probability, known as the metropolis acceptance criteria, is to choose the probability to accept a transition nu goes to nu prime with the minimum of one or e to the minus beta delta e. Does that satisfy that ratio? So if delta E is defined as E nu prime minus E nu, we want that ratio to be that Boltzmann factor. So we have min one e to the minus beta delta e over min one my e, min one comma e to the if I go in the opposite direction that changes the sign of delta e delta e. That ratio then is equal to, well, if delta E is positive, E to the minus a positive number is something strictly less than one, the minimum would pick it out. I would have E to the minus beta delta E on top, on bottom, if that number is positive, it's necessarily greater than one. So the min of those two functions would be one. If delta E is less than zero, then the min function in the numerator picks out one and in the denominator picks out the exponential, which is indeed then equivalent when I put that back in the numerator. This is a very clever choice from old Metropolis because one necessarily then accepts moves which lower the energy. So if you know you've lowered the energy, you don't have to draw a random number to then ask whether or not you're going to accept that transition. You only then have to accept, you only then have to draw random numbers to ask whether or not you fluctuate into higher energy states, simplifying the algorithm. Okay, so what then is the procedure for a metropolis Monte Carlo? Well, first, you would attempt some move you would compute the corresponding change in energy between the new configuration and the old configuration if as we just said delta e is less than or equal to zero we know that we're going to accept that because the min function will pick out one. So I, with probability one, accept the move. Else, 
in those cases where the energy increases, we accept with a probability, which is e to the minus beta delta e. So how do you accept with a probability of that number? Well, you can draw a random number uniformly distributed between zero and one. The probability then that x is less than e to the minus beta delta e is probability e to the minus beta delta e. So therefore I need to draw one number and I need to just check if that number is less than that Boltzmann factor of the change in the energy in the new configuration. And that's the algorithm. You just then iterate these three steps until any averages that you're trying to compute have converged. So that's in general how a metropolis algorithm would work. For the specific Ising model, how would we implement this? Note that whether or not we accept the move, whether or not we actually successfully transition between a different to a different state and thus accumulate a new configuration to average with depends only on the change in the energy. However, we know that energies are extensive. As I increase the size of the system, the energy increases. Therefore, changes in energy will scale as the number of spins that are changed in that transition. If I try to make a change of many spins at one time, the magnitude of delta E more likely than not is going to increase or is going to scale as the number of spins I am changing all at once. E to a large number has a very small probability if it is negative in its argument. So the likelihood of making transitions is going to be, we expect, much lower if we try to flip a whole bunch of spins at once. So the most success, you know, a successful algorithm for studying the Ising model and doing Monte Carlo generally is to try to make very small perturbations, very small changes to the configuration of the system such that you have high likelihood of accepting that move. The, the smallest change we can make to the Ising model would be to randomly select an individual spin. Call that spin SI. To attempt to flip that spin, such that SI would go to minus SI. That's then our whole attempt probability is just one over the number of spins, which is symmetric whether or not I flip, I pick spin one and try to flip it or spin two and try to flip it. So indeed that's a symmetric attempt probability. Once we flip the spin, we need to calculate the change in the energy which is also not that complicated to do. If we only flip one spin, the corresponding change in the energy is local. 
we only need to look at the nearest neighbors of that spin to compute that delta E. We can see that explicitly by looking at the energy of the Ising model for spin I and all of the spins J having flipped relative to what it would have been having not flipped in the original configuration that is going to be equal to so the energy is minus J, SI, flipped times the nearest neighbors to SI, less H minus SI, that's the energy of the flipped configuration the energy of the original configuration would have been to put in the original value of the spin SI. Looks like so. All of the other interactions, all of the other terms, plus other spins, plus other spins, and the full energy function, those cancel when I take that difference. The full then total change is something relatively simple to compute. SI comes out factored in front. I have a J minus all of this. So a minus and a minus, that is then overall plus times the nearest neighbor sums plus twice H. Get a minus here. Minus is there. So I need to know the value of the spin originally and then this calculation of the average magnetization of its neighboring spins, that gives me that delta E. All right, having computed delta E, we ask if delta E is negative, Metropolis tells us to accept that change. If Delta E is positive. We need to draw a random number. Call it X between zero and one. If X is less than E to the minus beta delta E, we then accept that tra transition. Otherwise, we reject and re-establish that configuration. Whatever happens in lattice, we can then use that new configuration to update any average we're trying to compute. and iterate the whole procedure. So then that's the basic algorithm. So that's in effect what we would need to code up. We need to write down a representation for the configuration, so a matrix that has spins 
on all the lattice positions. So those are our dynamic variables we would need to keep track of. We need to write routines to pick spins at random and to flip them and compute the energy change. And then routines to do any of the analysis with the configurations that would come out of this, uh, this Metropolis Monte Carlo procedure. So there's a number of kind of practical things to consider when doing these sorts of these sorts of simulations. One would be to ask, you know, what configuration should we start with? We designed this algorithm such that in the infinite time limit, the system samples that Boltzmann distribution, but it need not at finite time sample states exactly related to a Boltzmann distribution. So in practice, the choice of an initial condition could affect the subsequent results. So then we have to consider you know, what is an initial condition which is close in some sense to the conditions we want to sample. If we are considering running this algorithm at low temperature, we probably want to start with a system in a configuration representative of what we'd expect the system at low temperature to look like, namely most spins up or most spins down. If we want to consider the system at temperatures greater than the critical point, we probably don't want to start the system then in a system that's all spin up. We probably want to draw spins randomly with up and down. Again, this is only a problem if we run for a finite amount of time, which then begs the question, you know, how long should one iterate this procedure to obtain averages? Or how do we quantify errors? There's no systematic error. There's no approximation being made in the treatment of this system, but there are statistical errors. Just like if you were doing an experiment and making a measurement, one needs to repeat that measurement again and again in order to have high confidence that the number that you are reporting is the right number. As you evaluate the statistics in a system that you are simulating, you are making measurements and you need to control the statistical errors of those measurements. There are sources of noise as the system fluctuates to different configurations. And so one needs to be able to quantify the standard errors associated with those fluctuations. You might also ask, what exactly should you calculate? Well, if we were talking about the phase transition in the Ising model, you might think that a sensible thing to compute is the order parameter, the average value of the magnetization. But one has to be careful in even just evaluating the average magnetization because broken symmetry, having say all spins up at lower temperature is not something which is truly broken in a finite system. That brings the question of how to mitigate the fact that you can't actually simulate a Avogadro's number of particles or spins. 
how do you control finite size effects or corrections due to any expectation value you're evaluating? Part of this is a question of boundary conditions. A macroscopic solid has a vanishingly small amount of surface relative to its volume, a way to impose or to not have, not represent a surface in the system is to not have a lattice that has an interface. One can do this by employing so-called periodic boundary conditions where a lattice at its leftmost site, rather than having a broken bond, not having a spin further to its right to interact with, interacts back with the particles or the spins over on the left. That mitigates the problems of finite size effects, but still for any finite system, even a very large one, symmetry is not strictly broken. So computing just the average magnetization may be difficult to interpret. It is often the case that looking at the whole probability distribution of the magnetization is more informative. In fact, the average value of the magnetization, for example, as a function of applied field is information encoded in that probability distribution. If we were to write down the average value of the magnetization as a sum over configurations, that fluctuating variable M, the probability of seeing that specific configuration like so, say in a partition function under this un, with a system at zero field. So we could, in fact, define the Eisen model at zero field, having some reference energy just due to the exchange interactions. At finite field, we know we add a term into the Hamiltonian into the energy function. That's H times M. This whole thing, therefore, can be rewritten as an expectation value of M weighted by H beta HM in a system without a field, like so, which is computable if one knows the probability distribution of the fields of the magnetization. If one could compute P of M, one can therefore get the average of M at any field just by computing this weighted expectation value. Now, this sort of thing is not always a practical thing to do. Averaging exponentials are often complicated because they have very large variances. All right. So this is the Eisen model. This is the algorithm that one can use to study it using the so-called Metropolis Monte Carlo scheme. I will next lecture code up 
uh, this algorithm in Python and make that code publicly available to you. I'll put it on B courses, sans a couple key steps that you'll have to fill in yourself. And the final homework, which will be due during RRR week, will be using this code to study the Eisen model to compute specific quantities. And in addition, have a number of extra credit assignments associated with it, where you can do extra calculations like devise means of actually trying to evaluate this probability as a function of the magnetization. Turns out that requires a couple more tricks to make it an effective or a, a, a possible calculation to do. All right, that's all I've got for today. So I'll look forward to seeing you all in the live session.